All right, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us on this talk, uh, where I'm going to talk about how I build a new social network in under four weeks using serverless in the GraphQL. So this is related to a project that I recently worked on for a client where I built a backend for a new social network that lets you, mostly university students, register your sporting interests and uh, find other people to do sports with. You can arrange your activities like basketball match and have a group chat, or you can just message each other and to arrange doing some sports together like jogging in the park. So the client is a bootstrapped, uh, private fun privately funded startup. So there's a lot of constraints on money and therefore development time. And they also need to have something in place before the new semester starts, which uh, didn't leave us with a lot of time to get everything ready in place. So from the get go, I had some pretty clear goals to work with in order to help me drive uh, technology decisions and uh, what approaches I should take. We want to maximize the speed of development because the client just need to get something done quickly and they can't afford a long development cycle. At the same time, they need something that can scale to millions of users if it takes off. They already have an agreement with local universities in Belgium to roll it out to tens of thousands of students right away. And uh, this is especially important because the first version of the app they built with uh, PHP and the running on two servers was a complete disaster uh, and uh, it crashed on launch day. So we can't repeat that mistake. The system also needs to have a minimum upkeep. Uh, again, the client just can't afford to hire a full-time development team to look after this. So it's the system pretty much have to run itself and uh, not fall under. And it also needs to be cost efficient as well as we scale to hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of users. So the project was put together with a very small team of just three engineers, including myself, uh, where I was working part time, maybe doing two to three um, days a week for a good about you know, four or five weeks, maybe in total. Um, so we didn't just build a mobile app as well. We also built a CMS for the app. Uh, as well, which uh, will be used by the founders to onboard new universities and to manage the list of predefined sports you can select in the app. And the CMS will also going to be used by the university staffs to manage their profile and to publicize their sports programs. So I'm not going to show you the full architecture, uh, but here are a few of the key components. We have uh, CloudFront and S3 for image assets and videos and such. Uh, and for authentication, we use Cognito. There's one Cognito user pool for the mobile app and then another one for the CMS. And the backend is all done in GraphQL using AppSync. Again, one for the mobile app and the one for the CMS. And they each have uh, resolvers that point to um, DynamoDB for simple get and put and query operations. For anything that's more complicated than that, I tend to have a Lambda resolver and that Lambda function might also do something more complex uh, against the DynamoDB tables or other resources. And you can also use a pipeline resolver instead of Lambda for a lot of these things really. But I just find it's a bit easier for me to do it with Lambda and uh, it would be easier for me to hand it off to somebody else later as well. Uh, and uh, we also use Algolia for search and Algolia is arguably the closest thing you have to a serverless Elasticsearch service right now. And to get the data we have into our Golia indices, I use the DynamoDB streams to trigger Lambda functions so that whenever data changes in the raw um, DynamoDB tables, they are synchronized to our Golia. For example, whenever a user creates or updates their profile or when they start a new uh, sports activity in the app. And uh, also capture business intelligence events from the different Lambda functions and use a firehose delivery stream to buffer and uh, batch them into uh, S3. And so we can then run BI analytics, um, analytics against them using Athena. Again, this is not the actual architecture diagram, but just a summary of the different services I used and how they kind of fit together from a high level. I'm not going to sort of bore you with all the uh, architecture diagrams. Uh, it's, it's just going to be a lot of lines between AppSync and uh, DynamoDB or Lambda. 
uh, moving a little you know, bit high up the uh, I guess the, the, the abstractions so we have uh, different uh, we have multiple AWS accounts which is a good security practice and helps limit the blast radius of any security breach and it also gives you consolidated billing and the billing reports across all of your accounts because we use the AWS organization for managing these accounts and we have four independent organization units for dev, for staging, for production, as well as as, uh, as well as an org unit for accounts that manage the shared resources. Um, for example, there's a shared users account for single sign-on, uh, and there's a shared account for collecting all the different all the all the information from different accounts using CloudTrail. And at the root of the organization, we have a couple of uh, service control policies or SCPs. Uh, for example, to deny access to all services outside of a EOS one, because I know that's the only region that we are going to use right now. And also it disables any actions to any attempt to disable CloudTrail or to delete any data that's been collected in the centralized S3 bucket uh, for audit. Again, remember, all of this was done by one person working part time for a couple of weeks. And it's only possible because I could stand on the shoulders of giants. And really, all the hard work was done by AWS and the different service teams. And I can rely on good tools like the serverless framework to help me manage and deploy my application. Uh, so my name is Yan Trey. I have been uh, using AWS for over 10 years now. Uh, nowadays, I'm an independent uh, control, um, consultant, and I'm also an, uh, one of the AWS serverless heroes as well. For the last couple of years, I've been focusing primarily on serverless technologies, including, funny enough, migrating another so uh, social network um, to serverless a couple of years ago. And that was one of my first, uh, I guess, forays into the serverless space. Uh, you can read all about, all about that uh, with the link at the bottom of this uh, screen. So nowadays, I spend half of my time working with Lumigo as a developer advocate. And the Lumigo, for those of you who haven't heard about them, is a troubleshooting platform for serverless applications, which really makes it easy for you to monitor and troubleshoot any problems that you find in production uh, with all your Lambda functions and uh, AppSync APIs and so on. And the other half of my time, I work as an independent consultant where I advise and help uh, companies adopt the serverless technologies through trainings, through advice, and sometimes working with clients like this one to help them deliver a, a MVP very quickly. So outside of my, uh, I, guess my I guess, professional work, I also written a couple of books with Manning, uh, published a video course with Manning as well. And uh, recently, I also published a new video course on AppSync, uh, which is open for uh, access now on the appsyncmasterclass.com. And I also run a, uh, on, on a, um, run a weekly podcast called the Real World Serverless, where I talk with other people that also build things in production uh, with serverless technologies. So I'm sure at this point, uh, most of you already heard about uh, GraphQL. Uh, and so I'm not going to take too much of your time here. So essentially, GraphQL has got this uh, schema language that lets you define the data types and operations that your API supports, including queries for fetching data and the mutations for, well, you know, mutating them. Um, and then the, the client of a GraphQL API will send a query or mutation operation to a GraphQL server that implements uh, this particular schema that you have defined. Uh, using this uh, GraphQL language. And the uh, Polo is probably the most popular implementation of a GraphQL server. Uh, in this case, a GraphQL server with the validated request against the sch schema and your pass system. And then in turn, it's going to then fetch the data from different data sources and then stitch, it, uh, stitch them together in the format the client has asked for. So think of it as your backend for front end, except you don't have to write bespoke endpoints every time the client wants another piece of data or it wants them in a slightly different uh, shape. So as for uh, AppSync, it's basically a fully managed GraphQL server, which allows you to map those uh, queries and mutation operations, as well as the data types you have to different resources in your AWS account. So out of the box, it supports uh, DynamoDB, uh, Lambda, uh, Aurora serverless, uh, Elasticsearch, as well as any raw HTTP endpoint uh, 
uh, out of the box, which you can use it to integrate with a number of different um, I guess AWS services as well as uh, any internal services that you have that may be still running REST. So as an example, um, as, a, as a logged in user, uh, if I need to call the app, uh, call the backend to fetch my profile, and in this uh, query operation, I'm able to fetch everything I need in one single operation, including my ID, first name, last name, gender, and uh, what sports I, I like, uh, all of which are mapped to a profile table in a DimeDB table. And uh, so AppSync would then fetch my profile using the authenticated user ID that Cognito has resolved. Uh, and then uh, I, as a, as, a, as, a, as a client, I'm sending a request to the backend using my JPT token that I have received from Cognito. And then the list of the sports in my profile, the only contains the ID for the sports because we want to be able to change to say the display name or uh, image URL for those uh, sports. So we don't want to be baking them into every single user's profile. So we're gonna need to expand those IDs into a full sport object and fetch the image URL and the display name for each of the sports that a particular user is interested in. So within GraphQL, that's called a nested resolver. And in this case, AppSync can then fetch those information from the sport table in DimeDB. So we're also good there. There's no need for the client to send two separate requests, same with, save, uh, saving us some additional round trip and, and hence uh, saving the problem of uh, the so-called M plus one request problem. And as for my activities, since I can have many, many activities, uh, so when I fetch my profile, I really just need the first page of the activities I have for the the next lot of, uh, for the next uh, list of next set of uh, activities that I'm going to do uh, in the future, which is likely all I'm ever going to be interested in when I'm looking at my profile. So AppSync runs a query against the activities table where the data is stored uh, with my user ID as a hash key. And then the timestamp of the activity is the range key here. And so we can easily get a page of activities in descending order. And since other people may also ask to, uh, ask to join my, say, basketball match next week, I also want to be able to fetch any requests uh, people have made to join my activities as well. So again, we only store the user ID in those requests and to display the request in the UI, we will, we are gonna have to expand those IDs into those users' uh, public profile so we can get their names and profile images and so on. Again, from the uh, using a nested resolver, that's also gonna get the data from the profile table. So as you can see, this is very, very flexible. The client can basically just ask for anything they want, but you probably also sense that there's some danger here as well, that the client can end up asking for uh, a lot of information and you can have a very deeply nested queries that can start to uh, impact performance and cost because you're gonna be making so many different requests to DynamoDB. So luckily, you can mitigate some of this by enable by enabling caching in, in AppSync, which lets you in, um, sort of control caching on specific resolvers and you can adjust the cache TTL on those uh, specific resolvers as well. And also to help me prevent uh, further nesting and to prevent uh, leaking any personal information like uh, date of birth and things like that, we have uh, different data types to represent the profile that you will fetch uh, on your, uh, for yourself versus a profile for other people that you want to see. So when you see other people's profile in the app, you only see the public uh, portion of that, of, their pro, uh, of that profile. And also that the public profile type is uh, much flatter so that it doesn't allow for a lot more nesting uh, from that point onwards. So that one query returns all the information I need from the front end to sort of render my profile page and to show the different sports I'm interested in and how good or bad I am at those uh, sports and so on. Uh, and when you see other people's profile, you're looking at the data that's only available through their public profile, uh, not information that they don't want, uh, that we shouldn't be sharing publicly, things like uh, date of birth and address and things like that. So AppSync itself is uh, very scalable. Um, the GraphQL uh, subscription implementation, for example, can support millions of uh, connected uh, clients and the AppSync API is deployed to multiple AZ uh, or availability zones out of the box, which uh, gives you a great baseline for resilience and you only pay for what you use at about $4 uh, per million operations. 
And as I mentioned earlier, it's got built-in support for caching, which uh, charges you extra. Uh, essentially, you're, you know, you're going to be paying for uptime for a memcached node. And it also, got, it also has a built-in monitoring support uh, with uh, CloudWatch and the CloudWatch logs as well, where you get the high-level metrics like the number of uh, uh, API requests, error count, and latency, which is great. But unfortunately, these are all aggregated. So it's difficult to tell which resolver is causing a problem with, say, higher latency or maybe a, a, a higher number, a high number of uh, 4SX or 5SX errors. Uh, since a single resolver, so a single uh, GraphQL request that can involve many resolvers. So luckily, you can also enable logging. And once you enable, you, once you set the field level, uh, field uh, sorry, attribute of the resolver uh, log level to all, then you can give get a lot of information about what's going on. You can um, see the state of uh, well, what's going on inside AppSync as well as the uh, the 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 transform the template request and res uh, response templates so you can really quickly narrow it down to specific requests that took a long time and then see you know or maybe there's some business logic problems in your template then you can really quick quickly find out uh, uh, what the problem is so for for performance issues like this uh, you can also enable x-ray as well which uh, really shines a light on what's happening behind the scenes and shows you a little timeline chart that shows you which operation is done when and that i guess the proportionally how much time is spent uh, of the whole request on say a particular time db call or a particular lambda function invocation and the X-ray also shows you a service map as well, and uh, so you can get a high-level view of uh, which services uh, your AppSync API is talking to, and uh, the overall health as well as the performance. So it gives me all of this out of the box, and I don't have to manage any servers, which is uh, pretty amazing, considering that you know, I'm one guy trying to manage the entire thing. Uh, you might also notice that uh, I've got quite a few DynamoDB tables. Uh, it's, uh, I guess right now it's about 15 tables uh, and more. That, uh, and uh, if you've been following what's happening in the DynamoDB space, uh, you may have heard about single table designs and wondering why I didn't condense some of these uh, or all of this uh, into a single table. So I do use the modeling techniques uh, that people advocate for uh, with uh, a single table design. And I do put some entities into the same table uh, things that tend to be, you know, queried together. But other than that, I don't see why I should force myself to arbitrarily put everything into a single table. Uh, in most cases, it's just not practical. And I'm also quite careful with using global secondary indexes because there's some serious uh, impediments uh, if you have too many of them. Uh, for starters, CloudFormation can only update the one global secondary index at a time. So if you ever need to add the two global secondary indexes in one update, then you're kind of you know, stuck. Um, if you ever need to rename a global secondary index, you're also kind of stuck because uh, that can only do, that's two operations. Uh, um, and uh, you have to carefully manage your commits and uh, what you push through your CI pipeline so that uh, you don't, you don't ever update more than one global secondary index at a time, which is just so easy to mess up. And also when you're building something new, you haven't figured out all of your assets patterns yet. And whenever you change your mind, those changes are gonna be difficult, especially since you can't deploy two global secondary indexes uh, changes in one go. So do you really wanna deal with that? Um, I know I don't. And often when I need to read you know, a couple of related items from different tables in one single request, which is oftentimes the, well, one of the reasons why you might want to consider using a single table. Um, well, AppSync kind of just takes care of all that complexity for me anyway. And it stitched them together for me nicely after it's made multiple requests to different tables. So some of the sort of advantages that you get with a single table just doesn't quite translate or this, this is not as valuable when it comes to working with AppSync. And if I was to use a single table design with AppSync, then I also end up just having to write a lot more custom VTL code than I would like to uh, or I have to otherwise. And I don't know about you, but I don't know many people, I don't know anyone who really likes a VTL. It's not exactly the nicest thing to work with. But what about the potential cost savings? 
one of the arguments for single table design is that uh, you can use one query to fetch multiple items and the way that the read units are calculated based on item size means that you can potentially you now save a lot of read units with queries so you have uh, one query to read the four items uh, that might count as uh, one read unit whereas uh, if you have multiple tables then that could be four separate get item requests which will count as uh, four read units uh, well you know what a sensible caching strategy is going to save you a lot more than single table design is ever going to save you uh, because you're going to cut out most of that request to DB before they even happen and also unless you're operating at a high enough scale those micro savings just doesn't mean anything uh, meaningful when it comes to your uh, your down DB cost uh, and for my for this application i got an a 99 cash hit rate on average throughout the whole day uh, which means uh, you no know, 99 of requests doesn't even hit down on db um, so We've been live for way more than over a month now, and uh, in that first month, uh, we ended up with about you know, 250,000 API requests a day. Uh, and uh, for that whole month, uh, uh, we had a lot of requests to DB because uh, uh, those some of these operations are really quite intensive. But at the end of the month, uh, our, our DB bill was like $4 uh, at I mean, sure, at super high scale, and you know, if you're talking about uh, Amazon.com, then those small cost savings for, from single table design can be really significant. But for a lot of applications that you, know, you and I are building, um, we are just never going to really hit those uh, those numbers. And uh, even in the cases where we have a lot of throughput, again, a sensible caching strategy can be far more effective at the cost saving uh, compared to making your application more complex using single table designs. Um, yeah, for this app, um, I really don't need to optimize for the best performance or scalability. And uh, having multiple tables is more than sufficient, uh, at least for the foreseeable future for this app. And the thing with a single table design is that it's just more complex. Uh, it requires a, a really thorough understanding of how DiamondDB works, especially in terms of a global segment index. Now, I don't remember who said this, uh, but I do prefer to design my system as if it's going to be run by idiots because I wonder it will be. And in most of cases, uh, that idiot is myself in three months time uh, when I look back and uh, I can't remember why I did certain things. Uh, so as much as I enjoy you know, the single table designs uh, techniques and I do use them sparingly, I just don't think it makes any practical sense for me to arbitrarily restrict myself to using one table for everything. And in terms of uh, authentication, as I mentioned earlier, we use a cognitive user pool uh, and I set up an identity uh, federation uh, so that users can sign in using Facebook and Apple as well. And on the client side, we use the Amplified JS library to integrate with Cognito, which uh, really makes things quite simple as far as uh, authentication is concerned. Um, I didn't use the Amplify CLI to create and configure the Cognitive User Pool. I configured it with uh, uh, CloudFormation uh, in the serverless framework because, well, I already know how to do it. And if anything, I need to know what's been configured. Uh, and I also think that while the Amplify CLI is great for quickly bootstrapping a new app, especially for a team that doesn't really have a, a lot of experience with AWS and Cognito, it helps you get something going quickly and gives you some good defaults. Uh, but I've also heard that it doesn't do so well with uh, some changes and a few people have told me that they've had to delete the entire stack when it got stuck and they can't you know, deploy certain changes. Again, that's just not something I'm willing to deal with uh, for a client project that I need to maintain in production. And the Amplifier can also provision and configure the DAM DB tables with AppSync API for you as well. Uh, but I don't agree, agree with a lot of the decisions that it makes. For example, how it defaults to using DynamoDB scan for list operations. And in this particular case, the DynamoDB schema and access patterns are really important and uh, with potentially huge scalability and cost implications. So I want to have a tighter control around that and need to really understand my access patterns intimately. And ultimately, I think it's just the uh, hides a bit too much details from you and then not being able to easily drop down to CloudFormation and then you know, change some of the resources or how they're provisioned. Uh, it's going to really re uh, restrict me when I need to make uh, changes and, and evolve the app going forward. So 
Um, moving, I guess, moving closer to the code, I use the server framework instead to help me package and deploy my application um, because it's, well, A, very mature, it's got a great community around it, it's very extensible through a whole range of different plugins from the community, and uh, we're going to see two of these in a minute. Uh, and I was already very familiar with it. It's been my go-to solution for a number of years, so, so I'm very proficient with the serverless framework. And in this case, I've got one repo for the whole backend and everything is configured in one server. So YAML and it's deployed as one CloudFormation stack. So resource reference and all that was very straightforward. Even as the project continued to grow and to deploy, I just had one command I need to run, serverless deploy, that's it. And to make it easy for me to configure all these different resolvers I had with AppSync, I, I used this plugin called the Serverless AppSync plugin, which really made things quite simple. Um, as I mentioned, I had the two AppSync APIs, one for the mobile app and the one for the CMS. So I broke these two out into their own files to keep things a bit tidier and more manageable uh, in my main server. So YAML and each of these um, AppSync I guess, files is going to look something like this, whereby I configured them to use the, to reference the right cognitive user for, for authentication. And I configured the login setting in production. We don't want to be logging everything because it's going to generate so much logs to CloudWatch that the cost associated with that is going to be a problem. And then I configure my resolvers and data sources in the same file. For many of these resolvers, uh, we are going straight to DynamDB. So the request and response templates have to be written in the VTO, uh, which, is the same, which is the same templating language that the uh, API Gateway uses as well. So I'm kind of familiar with it already. Um, and honestly, I think the official documentation does a decent job and it gives you a bunch of examples that you can just follow. And most of them look quite simple anyway. Um, but if you start to write uh, more custom, more so custom code uh, for business logic uh, in VTO, then that, at that point, maybe you want to think about uh, moving those logic into a Lambda function instead. So as the project grew, I pretty quickly hit the 200 resources limit in the cloud formation, which uh, luckily AWS has since then increased that limit to 500 resources. But at the time it was still 200 and uh, yeah, we hit that 200 limit uh, pretty quickly. Um, so luckily for us, there's also the split stacks plugin, which uh, can split your one stack into multiple cloud formation stacks by splitting some resources into nested stacks. And after some you know, uh, trial and error, I found an approach uh, that can help me just let it uh, continue to to, um, to to scale the application. Uh, it doesn't matter how many resources I have, I guess within reasons. So in this case, uh, we have uh, over we have two AppSync APIs with over 200 resolvers and the total of more than 600 um, CloudFormation resources, and they split across multiple uh, nested stacks, uh, but in a way so that we can continue to grow the application and add in more and more features, and it's not going to hamper, and that CloudFormation limit is not going to hamper us. Which kind of brings me to CI/CD. Uh, since the whole code base was already in GitLab, I decided to just use uh, GitLab CI/CD. Uh, and the one technique I've used in most of my projects is to install the server framework as a dev dependency, which means I don't have to manage any extra dependencies on a CI server, and I can just have a you know MP, a very helper, very simple helper script uh, in my package JSON. So basically, just the uh, um, npm you know, CI to restore. Uh, dependencies to the exact version I had in the in the project uh, as they are configured in the uh, package.json file and then run the npm run serverless deploy to trigger deployment using the version of the server framework that's been installed in the project as a dev dependency and that's it that's basically my CI so it couldn't be simpler and uh, when it comes to testing one of the challenges we're using something like AppSync is that it's you no know, it's a managed service it's a black box so how do you test it locally? I mean, there are tools that can simulate AppSync locally. I don't tend to gen no, I don't tend to bother with them uh, as they don't cover everything, including IAM policies. And honestly, I think those uh, VTL templates are so simple that most of the time they just work. Uh, where it tend to go, be, go to, where it tend to go wrong is in my Lambda functions where I tend to do more complex things. So with uh, VTL templates, uh, you you can also and I do sometimes uh, write unit tests for the templates themselves. 
but most of the time I tend to focus on my testing on the Lambda functions because that's where I do more integration with other services like uh, Golia or do more complex things with DynamDB. So what I can do is in that case is to execute a function locally and have the function talk to the real DynamDB tables or our Golia as part of my uh, uh, integration testing. I don't tend to use some mocks or stubs uh, or simulate those services uh, locally with uh, things like local stack. I just find you know things that are local stack it takes too long for them to you know to, to configure them to get them working properly and they're quite brittle as well. It's very it's, and it's just much easier to provision those resources and then use them in my integration tests uh, by executing the lambda function locally. And then once I've got some confidence that the function is doing what it's supposed to in terms of how it integrates with other services, I will deploy the function to, uh, to some environment and then I can have end-to-end tests that run user stories like uh, user logs in, creates a profile, then does a search and then joins another user's activity and so on. And I can run those, uh, those tests against the uh, deployed GraphQL endpoint or AppSync endpoint so this will always be run after a, a deployment and if you have any uh, failed end-to-end -end tests then great use this as a rehearsal for how do you debug real problems in production and if this process is difficult then guess what's going to happen when you do have a problem once the system is live use that as a signal that you need to improve how you're logging how you're monitoring the system and enable x-ray tracing if you need to and if it's if you're struggling to debug failures or problems in a controlled environment like your end-to-end -end test then you're gonna have a much bigger problem when this thing is running in the wild so don't optimize for your comfort and uh, with these local simulators is a false sense of security and finally let's talk about the AWS organization setup. So I mentioned I had the several org units uh, and the AWS accounts, and I don't want to manage all of this by hand. So I want infrastructure for, uh, as code for this as well. Luckily, there's this tool called the uh, org formation, which gives me exactly that and lets me provision and manage my entire AWS organization with uh, infrastructure as code using a YAML syntax that's, uh, that's very, very similar to CloudFormation. And I can also use it, um, it also makes it easy for me to template my landing zones, uh, which is basically what are the basic uh, infrastructures that should be provisioned on a new account, things like KMS encryption keys, uh, VPCs, and so on. So in this case, I was able to declare a master AWS account and uh, as the root for my organization. Again, it all done in code using a syntax that's very similar to CloudFormation. And I'm able to provision a new account and then set up budget alarms with just a few lines of code and I can attach the, these accounts to my org units which I also created in code uh, and I can also configure service control policies for example here I know the only region we're going to be using is the EU West one so I can set up a service control policy that denies all actions against regions other than EU West one and apply this policy to the root of the organization so it gets applied to all my AWS accounts I can also configure my password policy for AWS users and use this password policy in all of my accounts as well. And whenever I make any changes, I just need to run this one command to update my entire AWS organization as well as update all of my landing zones. And to configure my landing zones, I can configure what is called a task where I specify basically a CloudFormation template and uh, provide the bindings to my organization, which basically says, which resources from the template should be created in which AWS account by binding its resource to org units or to specific AWS accounts. Okay, and here's an example of uh, one of these templates where I basically have a, just a normal CloudFormation resource for an IAM user, but I can bind this resource to a subset of accounts in the organization using this concept of uh, organization binding which is a way for you to filter accounts by org units and so on so on and so on it's it's it looks a bit funky um but basically here i can iterate through the ellipse accounts that are provided by a binding i mean don't worry if the mecha the mechanics of how this actually works looks a bit alien to you once you spend a bit of time with org formation it will start to make a lot more sense and uh, you'll find the things like this uh, to be very very powerful and things that are really difficult to do otherwise 
And to update my landing zone, I just have to run another command and uh, that's it. Again, everything's hooked up to CI. It's just really easy. It's, uh, it's, it's a really powerful tool uh, and I do recommend that you check it out. It's available from GitHub and it's maintained by uh, by someone from uh, who used to work at the uh, well, MoneyU, uh, which is a bank here in the Netherlands. So that's the kind of the three main tools I've used in this project. The server framework for deployment automation, uh, AppSync for the managed GraphQL server, and the org formation for automating or, or any automation around the AWS organization itself. And if you go back to the goals that I uh, started with in terms of speed, getting everything done within four weeks is pretty good <laughs> considering the amount of stuff that's involved and I was only working part-time on this project as well. So speed of development, you know, check. AppSync can scale to support uh, millions of users. Absolutely no problem, check there as well. Uh, and I have uh, zero EC2 instances and uh, no servers to manage. So, and no networking, VPC and all of that. So in terms of uh, upkeep, yep, definitely minimum upkeep, check. So for as for cost efficiency, um, so we've been live uh, for a little while now uh, since the, I guess Belgium went into lockdown again, the traffic has definitely dipped significantly, but uh, right after we launched, we had over 15,000 organic in stores and uh, we were averaging around uh, you know, 250,000 API requests per day. And our AWS bill for that the first month and two or, or two was around $60 per month. Uh, and most of that was just the API, uh, so AppSync caching. And the, considering that we were using about 5% of the cache capacity, so that $31.68 is going to be pretty flat even as we continue to grow our traffic by 10x uh, once, every, once the, I guess the pandemic has finished and people are back to doing sports and they're back to going to universities, universities and the sports centers uh, to do yoga classes and things like that. Uh, but yeah, this is, and the the the, AP, the absent caching is going to save us tons of money on the Lambda and Dime DB costs. And besides what you see here on this sheet, there's also another like fifteen dollars or so on the CloudWatch logs and X-ray and so on. So all in all, pretty reasonable price to pay for something like this uh, for the whole backend. Oh, and in terms of the latency, in general, it's also really good as well. P99 is uh, stable around the five hundred milliseconds during the day when people was uh, were using it, uh, but when it's the, in the middle of the night in the Belgium where the app is actually you know, mostly being used, you can see those uh, P99 start to go up uh, because there are more Lambda cold starts, a few, a few people using it and other things like that. Uh, but overall, we are really still quite happy with uh, what, we've see, uh, what we're seeing in terms of the performance and scalability as well. And that kind of that brings me to the end of this talk. Again, I want to thank you guys very much for being with us uh, this uh, um, um, at this conference. As I mentioned earlier, I spend most of my time as an independent consultant. So if you want to see how servers can help you go faster or just need some help upskilling your team, then let me know. Go to theburningmonk.com to see how we can work together. And uh, as I also mentioned before, I've got a new video course on the AppSync. So go check it out at appsyncmasterclass.com to see how you can build a Twitter clone using things like AppSync, Lambda, DynamDB, Cognito, Vue.js, and uh, Tailwind CSS. Uh, and with that, thank you and uh, stay safe.